Hello, my friends and fellow travelers. My name is Pierce. This is my channel, Tales from the Road. Thanks so much for stopping by. Because you clicked on this video, we're obviously going to talk about the beautiful South American nation of Peru. But if you're interested in going to the Amazon or to the northern part of Peru and you're looking for advice, this is not the video for you because I've personally never been there. We're going to focus solely on southern Peru, specifically the Cusco Valley, as well as Lima and Arequipa, because these are places I've been and that I can recommend. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know before you go. So let's get started. Vamos, mi amigos. So as we always do with these videos, let's start with a little geographical and historical context so we can get to know Peru a little bit better. So first off, where is Peru on the map? Peru is on the western side of South America. It's got Ecuador to its north, Brazil to its east with a huge Amazon rainforest border. It's got Bolivia and Chile to its south. Without spending like an hour on the historical context of Peru, I do want to highlight that Peru is one of the most interesting historical places in South America because it was home to the mighty Incan Empire, the largest indigenous empire found in South America. When you go to Peru, specifically the sacred valley of Cusco, a lot of the things you will see are built by indigenous tribes and of course by the Incans themselves. It's incredibly interesting, there's so much to learn and discover, and there is a huge presence of indigenous culture within Peru, which makes it a very unique place to go if you're looking for a cultural travel place in the world and specifically in South America. If you're going to South America or Peru in general, you're going to know that the indigenous empires fell to the Spanish, so in Peru, there's a big colonial Spanish presence, there's the indigenous presence, and then there's the modern Peruvian state that's been built on top of all of that. When talking about modern Peru, I just want to highlight quickly that it's a very diverse country and probably not exactly what you're expecting, as it's not just a typical Spanish colonial place. Many people from all over the world now call Peru home, and they have large immigrant communities from basically every country in South America and Central America, as well as a big influx of people from Eastern Asia, specifically Japan and China. This means that in the cuisine, in the language, in the sort of overall cultural ideation of Peru, it's very mixed and you'll find things that are sort of out of place, even though they are right at home where they should be. For example, you'll see one of the most famous dishes, and I'll talk about this in the food section, is actually fried rice, which comes from Peru's very robust Chinese community. Peru also famously had one of the first presidents in the world with Japanese descent that is not from Japan originally, although he is in jail for corruption. So, you know, it is what it is. That being said, Peru has so many things to discover, so let's talk about those in the more practical section. So first off, let's start talking money. The money in Peru is called the Peruvian Sol, and right now it's trading at four Sol to one US dollar. Is Peru inexpensive or expensive? I would say generally, if you're doing like local activities, Peru is quite cheap, although Peru has a large influx of tourists, specifically in the Cusco Valley region. So if you're talking about tours and restaurants and specifically visiting Machu Picchu, those things can be very expensive. Uh, we can say traditional Western prices or prices you'd find in the United States and the greater European area. Although Peru is a place where you can find a lot of value for your dollar when traveling, there's lots of cheap options, hostels, and also cheap local places to eat. But if you want to spend more money because of the tourist presence, you definitely can. So visas. Visas for Peru are pretty straightforward. Americans get 90 days when they arrive in Peru. You can arrive obviously through any major airport or also come via the land border. The land border may take some time depending on what country you're coming from. I came from Bolivia, so they had to stamp me out of Bolivia, which took some time because Bolivia is the only country in South America that requires a visa for Americans. If you're coming from a different country, it's probably not so complicated. So now on to the transportation. The transportation in Peru is pretty straightforward. If you're coming from the United States or any faraway place, you're probably going to fly into Lima, which is the capital city, or you could fly into the Cusco general region. You could fly into Arequipa. Of course, they have airports all over the country. So flying in is not a problem. There are domestic airlines, but there are also the general overall South America airlines that you'll find with reasonable prices for getting around Peru. These include Avianca or Latam. If you want to get around Peru by bus, which is certainly cheaper, you can definitely achieve this, although Peru is in the Andes, especially the southern part of it, so it is very mountainous, which means the buses do take a long time. I took a couple buses in Peru. Um, I wouldn't say they were necessarily bad or good, although I have a very 
a strong memory of them playing the same three movies on a loop for my 12-hour bus ride up to Cusco. If you do want to take buses, the schedules are not exactly online, so you'll probably end up having to go to the bus station to see what buses go where. They did have a robust offering of buses going both out of Peru, like if you wanted to go to Bolivia or to Chile, or if you just want to travel in Peru in general. A lot of people, because the salaries are not super high for local people, do travel by local bus. If you're worried about the transportation in Peru, you're probably worried about taking pictures when you're in the country. And I always think, man, my iPhone just doesn't do the job sometimes, especially when I'm taking specific photos of beautiful monuments, like maybe when you go to Machu Picchu. And luckily this video is sponsored by a company called Sandmark. Sandmark makes high quality iPhone accessories for people who are interested in photography, just like I am. The thing is, modern smartphones typically have pretty good cameras. You don't need to buy a $2,000 or $3,000 camera anymore. But there are limitations, especially with telephoto. Telephoto, of course, is when you zoom using your iPhone. It gets quite pixelated. That's where Sandmark comes in. Sandmark makes some of the industry's best telephoto lenses for your smartphone. So let me show you. When you buy a telephoto lens from Sandmark, which I would definitely recommend, you take your smartphone, which I have here, and they're going to give you a special case that you can put directly on there depending on the model of your phone. Here you'll be able to see that over the camera portal, there's a special screw-in attachment so that you can add the telephoto lens directly onto your phone. The telephoto lens itself is very small, so you'll be able to, of course, carry it with you wherever you are, in a backpack, in a small bag, not a big deal, and comes with a handy carrying case in case you want to transport it safely. What you do is you simply screw it on, like so, and then your smartphone has a professional level telephoto capability, making sure that you can capture those crisp, beautiful travel photos that you want to without getting those pixelated zoom-in things that are just like the worst. They also sent me their filter attachment, which you can also add on to the exact same adapter on your phone, which lets you control the amount of light which gets into your camera's lens, just like an f-stop would on a really nice lens of a new camera. Both of these are extremely easy to use, very competitive on the market, and something that I'm definitely gonna use in my travel bag in the future. So thank you to Sandmark for sponsoring this travel video. Now, back to the Peruvian stuff. So now that you're taking beautiful pictures, let's talk about safety and how you can keep your camera safe when you travel in Peru. The safety in Peru is okay, but I wouldn't say it's the best. It falls in my general South and Central America rules, which is you need to be aware of where you are. You need to be aware of where you're walking. You need to keep your stuff in your eyesight, keep it safe. It's not the safest country. It's not the least safe country, it's somewhere in the middle. Some tips that I always say for Peru is always carry a little bit of money just in case, but don't keep your wallet, of course, visible. Sometimes it's best to leave your card and your passport at your hotel in case something weird does happen. One thing also for Peru is make sure you know what neighborhood you're staying in. Do a little bit of research, like if you're going to stay in Lima, do a little bit of research about the neighborhood before you book a hotel or a hostel just to make sure you're in a good place. And if you're walking around at night, maybe know where you're doing it or make sure the place is safe. For me, when I travel in South America at night, I always take Ubers. It's just the way to go generally just to make sure that you're keeping yourself safe at all times. When I was in Peru, there were a couple sketchy moments, but in general, there was no issues. So now we're onto my favorite section, which is food. And the food of Peru is fantastic. It's a beautiful food culture with so much to offer, whether you like high level gastronomical restaurants, some of the best restaurants in the world, or you just wanna eat like grandma food, Peru's got it all. For many people when they go to Peru, they're gonna lean into the two dishes that I think are, please everybody. Number one is lomo saltado, which is basically fries with meat on it, like a stir fry dish. And number two is chaufa, which is basically Peruvian fried rice, obviously coming from the Chinese influence that I told you guys about earlier. The cuisine of Peru is number one, delicious, not too spicy, but you can find spicy things if you want. And also very diverse because they have the massive coastline. So they're known for ceviche, for dishes with fish and shrimp and all the fresh seafood that you get on the coast. Um, ceviche, which is basically fish cooked in lime juice, is I would say the national dish or one of the national dishes and something you can find on menus all over the country. Although they have a massive Amazonian region, so you get all the interesting fruits and vegetables that grow there, something a little bit more spicy, a little bit different, and has a lot of indigenous influence. And then in the south, you have the food of the Andes. So you get um, different kinds of potatoes, you get 
interesting vegetables that only grow at the high altitude and you get really deep indigenous culture like old school Incan cooking that you wouldn't normally have access to. I would say it's super diverse. If you go to Lima, you're going to get really nice restaurants with a sort of fresher vibe, seafood focused. But if you're in the Andes, of course, you can eat alpaca or llama because that's very common. You can try different indigenous sort of flavors and um, there's just a lot of diversity. There's so much beauty going on. Then they also have all of this immigrant cuisine, robust Chinatowns and communities that have spread all around Peru, giving a sort of Chinese, also Japanese, Peruvian cuisine, as well as the cuisine that Peru has with other influences, specifically Spanish, because the Spanish were in Peru for a long time. So now I'm going to tell you about the top things to do in Peru that I personally did. I'm going to give you my opinion of all the places I went to, things that are worth skipping, things that are worth checking out, and then I'll leave it up to you with what you want to do with that information. So I came into Peru via Bolivia. I took a bus to a city called Puno, which is on Lake Titicaca. If you have the opportunity to go to Lake Titicaca, it is really fantastic. You can go from the Peruvian side in Puno. You can go from the Bolivian side. There's a place called Copacabana, which is also very, very cool. Regardless of where you see it, it's a, it's a very unique experience. I've never seen anything like it. It's a very high altitude lake with crystal blue waters in a mountainous zone very specific. Um, I think the Bolivian side might be better. I've heard that it's better, but if you see it from Peru, definitely a trip worth doing. From Puno, I actually took an overnight bus to a city called Arequipa. The bus was long and a bit treacherous, but we made it in one piece. And Arequipa, which is in southwestern Peru, is a fantastic city with beautiful Spanish colonial architecture that's all white. And they have really, really beautiful old buildings, monasteries, churches to check out. It sits underneath a uh, big volcano or mountain, I'm pretty sure it's a volcano, and um, really good views. Um, it was a very cultural city, a very good food city. They have an amazing central market, and it's a city definitely that you shouldn't skip. Uh, if you are in that region, a lot of people go to the coast from there to a city called Ica, where you can see these amazing sand dunes. I didn't do that, but I've heard um, only good things from that sort of that part of Peru in general. From Arequipa, I took a domestic flight and I flew to Cusco. And I'll say a couple things about Cusco because a lot of people have a lot of questions because it's a place everyone goes. Number one, it's very touristy. Uh, people from all over the world come to Cusco specifically to see the Sacred Valley because the Sacred Valley has so much significant ruins from the Incan Empire. And then also to, of course, go to Machu Picchu. The city of Cusco itself is very interesting. It's a colonial city with really, really beautiful architecture. Like they have like just beautiful Spanish style buildings with a lot of new Peruvian architecture. They have old Incan walls and then they have, I think they call it Saxi Waman, sexy woman. It's a massive Incan ruin that you can visit that's just outside the city. It's, it's really like fantastic. As far as a city goes, there's so much to do around it and in it, as well as old whole, uh, cultural heritage churches, beautiful restaurants, interesting guest houses and hotels. All of that's very fantastic. I definitely recommend people to spend a couple days in Cusco checking out the city before you go to Machu Picchu. Cusco itself is a little bit more expensive than other places you'd find in Peru because of the large tourist presence. That means also the hotel price or hostel price overnight is also going to be higher. One thing to note in Cusco is that number one, the altitude is very high. If you come from Bolivia, you might be used to it, but if you fly directly into Cusco, you might want to take a couple days to acclimate yourself because it is 3,300 meters above sea level which um, is double the height of Denver for reference. The altitude sickness can definitely be a problem for some people. Um, so the, the big recommendation is don't drink the first couple days that you're in Peru, specifically if you fly in from a low elevation place because your body doesn't metabolize the alcohol as well and you can really do some damage to yourself. Also hiking and stuff in Cusco and walking up and down the sort of hilly areas can be challenging because you'll be out of breath because of the altitude. A lot of people recommend coca tea, which uh, is illegal in other countries, but is made from the coca leaf, which is what cocaine is distilled from. I tried it. It's like a very, very, very mild stimulant. They say it helps blood flow and oxygenation in your blood. It's worth a try if you're there, definitely. I'm not sure if it helps the, uh, the garrocha or the, uh, or the altitude sickness. It's very hard for me to say. Another thing to note is that Cusco uh, is pretty cold, especially because it's high in the Andes and specifically in the winter time, which is the summer in uh, the United States, it does get very cold. So make sure that you bring the right clothing. Um, the hotel that we were staying at was incredibly cold and it's the biggest complaint all over Cusco, regardless of if you're staying in a nice place 
or a cheaper place is that many of them are not insulated well, so the interiors of the buildings are just cold. That's just a reality of being in the Sacred Valley in Peru, I think. You can take some day trips from Cusco, specifically to Oliante Tambo, which is a old Incan city where they have really fantastic ruins. And then along the way, you can see some other things that have been built by the Incan society um, that are pretty well preserved. All of those are great. You can also go to the Rainbow Mountains, also great. Um, just know that all of this is very touristy because there are so many people coming to Cusco pretty much all throughout the year. So if you're looking for something that's like, very remote and not filled with people. That is not the experience you're gonna have. I had more of those experiences in Bolivia and Northern Argentina. In Peru itself, um, there was just masses of people everywhere. You wake up in the morning to go to the Sacred Valley tour and you'll just see white bus and white bus and white bus and white bus of tourists going throughout the city. So that's, that's part of the experience. Um, it's because Machu Picchu has become such a place that people want to visit. So everyone obviously is in Cusco to do that. So getting to Machu Picchu, what we did is from Cusco, we took a taxi to Ollante Tambo, that city that you can visit as part of the Sacred Valley thing. We went in the morning to Ollante Tambo, spent the time there walking through the ruins. And then after that, we took the train, which goes directly to a city called Aguas Calientes, which is right at the base of Machu Picchu. You can, however, if you want to take the old Incan trail, which many people do, it's like, I think a four day hike. You start in Ollante Tambo, you walk through the mountains, staying at little guest houses until you arrive at Aguas Calientes to then uh, do your Machu Picchu thing. Going to Machu Picchu for me was really quite an experience. Obviously, it's a wonder of the world. It's something extremely fascinating and worthwhile, and it was something that I would recommend everybody do um, if you go to Peru. Aguas Calientes is a city that was basically built for the tourist. So they have a big market, they have hotels, they have restaurants, and that's the city. Um, there's, there's obviously locals there who work with the tourists and stuff, but it's not like a natural place. So it's, uh, it's not like a historical city or anything. From Aguas Calientes, uh, you go to Machu Picchu. If you're going to Machu Picchu, you should definitely um, reserve your tickets well in advance, two months, three months, five months, as much as you want in advance because they're very competitive to get because the Peruvian government has done something smart, which is that they've limited the amount of people who can go to Machu Picchu per day. Number one, to preserve the site, which is great. But number two is just like, if there's too many people, the experience is bad because you're hiking. With the Machu Picchu ticket, there are like a couple different things you can do. There are different mountains um, and different views for the site. You're gonna walk through the whole site, but like one is a small mountain, one is a big mountain. I went on the smaller mountain because that was the only ticket that was available. Still, still very, very cool. So uh, whatever way you're looking at it is still definitely worthwhile. Going to Machu Picchu as well, you can take a bus from Aguas Calientes, which will take you to the top of the site. And then you can walk down, which is what I would actually recommend doing unless you really like hiking, because going down, it took us about an hour and 15 minutes. And it was, it's not an easy hike. Uh, I can just say that. Going up, however, probably could take you upwards of two and a half to three hours, depending on your fitness, um, just because it's, it's pretty steep to get up this mountain. So um, whatever you want to do, there are lots of options, but um, the way that I'd recommend is wake up early. I think I took the 6 a.m. bus up to the top of the site because you're going to do a lot of hiking in Machu Picchu and then you can take the bus down or you can walk. Walking's cool because you get to see the sort of jungly, beautiful rainforest situation that Machu Picchu sit in, but um, it's, still, it's still a hike, still a schlep. So uh, if you're not a hiker, maybe don't plan on hiking up because it might be more than you bargained for. Speaking about Aguas Calientes, everything in Aguas Calientes is expensive because it's a tourist site. So hotels are way more expensive than you would find anywhere else in Peru. The food is also more expensive than you would find and going to Machu Picchu is not cheap. So all of that take into consideration if you wanna make Machu Picchu a part of your Peru trip. Cusco is also a place where you can get to know the indigenous culture. And I remember one of the most interesting things I saw in Cusco was uh, they do an event every week. I believe it's on Wednesdays, but they do uh, Peruvian dancing, like indigenous dancing. And you can hear people speaking Quechua and dancing, which is really cool because it's not something like you find in a lot of other South American countries. And it was very memorable. So uh, that's at one of the local arts centers in the city center of Cusco. Definitely worth it. From Cusco, I flew to Lima. Lima is a super modern capital city. I kind of compare it to Los Angeles. It kind of feels like Los Angeles, except it's sort of cloudy all the time. 
The thing about Lima is that there's a couple neighborhoods to stay in more for like, that's just safer in general. Um, and that's basically centered around a place called Miraflores. You're going to find really good hotels there, good restaurants um, and hostels. I recommend staying there. It's a very nice area. The city itself is kind of sketchy. It's a massive city and uh, they have a lot of crime in Lima. So just be aware when you're traveling in Lima that you're staying in the place that you should probably be in and that you're in a place where you're comfortable. Go to the Old Town. The Old Town is massive. It's really interesting. It's right next to Chinatown as well. So you can spend a good day there wandering around the beautiful old churches and streets and then spend day like maybe like eating in Chinatown. It's something like very specific and cool. And then you can return to Miraflores, chill by the beach, um, enjoy the sort of rocky coastline of Lima. And uh, from there, I would say that's a pretty solid trip through Peru. I spent like, I think like 17 days in Peru, including Cusco, Arequipa, and Lima. Um, things do take time. Transportation takes time. It's a big country. And honestly, you could spend one month, two months, three months in Peru, depending on like what you want to do. It's like really like endlessly different vacations, whether you do the Amazon, whether you do the coastline, whether you do the Andes Mountains, whether you do all three or just one. Peru has so much going on and so much benefit for tourists, which is, I understand why it's one of the most popular places to visit in the world these days. That being said, we're going to stop there. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. It really helps me keep making these travel guides. Also, I'm doing my Project 197 where I'm cooking a dish from every country in the world. I cooked ají de gallina from Peru. It's a very famous Peruvian dish that's basically a sauce made from yellow ají peppers with chicken over some rice. You'll find it basically everywhere you go in Peru. It's awesome. That being said, I want to thank Sandmark once again for sponsoring this video, and we will see you guys in the next one. Hasta luego, mi amigos.